שלום, מה שלומך תל אביב? So today we're going to be talking about uh, blockchain security. Uh, even though the media is saying of uh, blockchain security company, it's not true. It's just a side project I did last year. Um, so how many of you have looked at smart contracts, doing smart contract development? Two, three, four, five people in the room. So it's a good thing because I'm going to explain what's a smart contract anyway. So what we're going to be discussing about today is basically what's a smart contract, the current limitation of the most popular platform for smart contract, which is Ethereum. And we're going to look a bit deeper on the actual bytecode and the assembly uh, used for like, smart contracts and what to expect in the future. Because even though uh, Ethereum is currently like, the most popular platform for smart contract, uh, and keep in mind this is a project I worked on in February of last year, so almost one year ago. Uh, back then, people were still not talking about ICOs uh, and all like, those things about smart contracts. So my personal opinion is currently like Ethereum, even though it's popular, is probably going to be replaced uh, either like this year or next year by like uh, a much more mature like virtual machine with a much better architecture uh, to actually develop smart contracts. So last year, a lot of things uh, changed actually. Uh, well, a year, ago, a year ago, blockchain security was not a thing. Uh, no, it's actually an actual thing. And even media like mis uh, quoting me saying that I'm the CEO of a blockchain security company, which I don't know to take it. You know, it's kind of funny, but you know, it's a bit embarrassing. Uh, so one of the main things that happened last year is security tools uh, have been uh, released uh, around like smart contracts and everything. And before that, there is not many security people who actually looked at uh, everything related to blockchain, you know. Um, and especially for like many reverse engineers, it was something looked at, you know, like web application or mobile application. You know, it's cute, but you know, it's not worth much attention. Uh, but it's changing. And you have like companies uh, like JP Morgan, you know, they did a fork of Ethereum called Quorum that are trying to like attract more security people to actually like review uh, their code because of an, uh, they have an open source platform. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Cisco Talos published a bunch of bugs that they have found, uh, including some in the actual Ethereum virtual machine, uh, where it was bound to happen sooner or later. Um, and we're going to talk about like, the actual risk of like, smart contracts. So the good thing is, if you have been reading the news over the past six months, you have heard like many ICOs have been hacked, and in some cases, it was mainly because of like, actual smart contract vulnerabilities. Um, I'm also going to be discussing of what could potentially replace Ethereum in the future. And also, like, a lot of like, new languages uh, appeared and emerged uh, last year, or about to emerge, like uh, Plutus, or Simplicity, which is like, the exact opposite of like, current languages. So they're pretty trying to make it like, easier and like, more simplistic. Uh, from like a language uh, point of view. So let's start with the uh, actual virtual machine and the actual compiler. So Solidity is the name of the compiler to uh, compile smart contract for Ethereum. Uh, what it takes as an input, we're going to see it in uh, later slides, but it takes like what looks like JavaScript code and translate it into like Ethereum bytecode. So like similar like to like most of like virtual machine that you would know, you know, with an interpreter. And Pros, it is uh, the name of the tool that I worked on last year and which I'm gonna present, which basically take like bytecode uh, as an as input parameters and like decompile it and you can also like run uh, dynamic analysis on it. Um, So, well, those are like pretty old slides, but currently like Ethereum is like quite popular. Uh, when I first like uh, gave that presentation uh, over the summer, Ethereum was popular, but 
we are still not sure if it was popular. Now it's like number two uh, in terms of market cap as, uh, a cr as a cryptocurrency, and it's also like the number one uh, platform we hear about when it comes to like people doing like ICOs, uh, even like tokens. Uh, this is like some garbage stuff called like banana coin using like Ethereum smart contract. Uh, there is a lot of stuff like using smart contracts. Most of them are like mainly garbage, but they're still trading uh, actual like dollar value on it. So if you're a criminal, uh, you know, it's an interesting target because it's uh, low risk and high gain, you know, because you don't need to like send the money to like some bank account or like to act some like Swift Service Bureau. Uh, you don't need to have like remote uh, SMB zero day and to patch like the Oracle like database in memory. It's just like, you know, a piece of like pseudo JavaScript code that have been compiled, which is like available everywhere because it's transparent. Um, you may not have the actual source code, but you can always like disassemble it or reverse it. And, you know, like the thing to keep in mind is like the smart contracts usually you know, there's going to be like a few hundred lines of code. So if you're an attacker, it's actually a great target. Um, and uh, yeah, and I would not be surprised that North Korea is like looking more to like targeting ICOs, you know, it's so already like targeting like cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, well, like those numbers are like pretty low now. Uh, some like report got published recently saying that uh, last year, like almost like 400 million uh, dollars got like stolen from ICOs and stuff. So it was definitely like a big target last year. It's going to be a bigger one this year. Uh, but yeah, yeah I I instead of like targeting ICOs or investing in Ethereum, I wrote a decompiler. So my loss. Uh, so one of the actual interesting things that happened also in November. So it's a bug I'm going to describe uh, later on. As some random dude was complaining that he uh, accidentally froze, well, actually, it's like not even 150, it's like 450 uh, million dollars of like uh, cryptocurrency because, yeah, of some like uh, dependency to a third uh, party library, which I'm going to describe later on. So, like, it's still like very experimental, and the amount of money being lost uh, with the, the actual technology uh, is proving it. So, you know, it's one of the main reasons, like I'm going to talk a bit uh, about the uh, actual limitation of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, you know. You're going to see a lot of the actual design is kind of like limited, even like the ways of uh, dealing with uh, registers, it's like a uh, stack based like registers, it's kind of like really ugly. Um, and then you have like uh, potential like alternative like coming up now, like uh, Canada that have like proper like registers, you know, so building a more mature VM. Uh, so it's becoming interesting, uh, at least from a research point of view, because if you're a researcher, you don't really care if it's useful or not. You just like like to look at stuff and see where it's broken or where you can actually uh, break things. So here is basically an example of a smart contract. As you can see, it's like very simple code. Uh, it looks very similar to JavaScript. So here is basically, if you want to write like your own coin or your own token, well, that's all you need, you would need like to like at least 40 lines of code. And once you use uh, the uh, Solidity compiler from Ethereum, you get this actual bytecode out. And at the uh, same time, it's also going to generate like uh, an, uh, well, the API interface, which is like the equivalent of like the PDB, if you're familiar with like Windows development application. Uh, except that instead of having uh, like a four gig, uh, four megabyte PDB, you're gonna get like well that uh, piece of like JSON code, which is gonna describe all the uh, function and their actual parameters. And each function is gonna have a signature. So every time you call it, uh, every time you call a function in a smart contract, you don't use its actual name; you use its actual uh, signature. Uh, memory management, that's where you kind of see that, uh, I mean, it's, it's still cool, you know, especially since they were like the uh, first main platform. That's also one of the things to keep in mind with uh, Ethereum, uh, because I don't want to bitch like too much about them. But uh, they're basically like the first platform like to demonstrate uh, like uh, a utility for smart contracts. 
And basically, a smart contract is like a software layer on top of like blockchain. Until uh, before that, like blockchain was purely used for like data, uh, not for to actually execute code. And with uh, Ethereum, it changed. They added like that software layer. So obviously, since it's inside the uh, blockchain, it means it's also immutable. Uh, and we all know like. Uh, or painful and costly it could uh, be to have uh, a piece of code that you could never patch. I mean, I'm sure they had good intent, but you know, like, uh, it, it creates a lot of issues. So regarding the uh, memory management, you have like three type of uh, memory. So obviously, you're gonna have a stack to pass like parameters to functions. Uh, here, you would use like the stack to pass parameters to functions, but also to the virtual machine instructions, um, because you don't have any like actual real registers. Everything is like stack based, and it's limited to like well, 1,024 entries. Um, so obviously, you have issues like stack underflow that happen a few times, and then you have two type of storage, so like a volatile uh, memory for when you work with strings and if you do like operations on, on them, or if you use, uh, if you use like, hash, um, like cryptographic hash functions. And then you're going to have that uh, permanent storage uh, that you can easily recognize whenever you're disassembling a smart contract with the uh, store and sload uh, instructions. Which is kind of where it gets interesting because well, that's where you have like the uh, actual data that you want to keep. Uh, basic blocks, so just like with like traditional like instructions or CPUs, uh, you, you're gonna have like your jump instructions, and actually to uh, find like a basic block, it's pretty easy, uh, at least with smart contracts, because they have an additional instruction called uh, jump test, which is most of the time there, but not always, uh, due to some compiled optimization, because it does not do anything. It's just basically saying, OK, that's like the actual destination or the entry point of a new basic block. Uh, and then you have like all your jump instructions. Uh, so of course, you have like conditional jumps. And where it kind of gets tricky, like I said, like the uh, actual stack, uh, is on, uh, like used for everything, even to pass like parameters to instructions. So you you have like those weird instructions like uh, swap, like to swap like entries in the stack, uh, to duplicate. You have dup, and then you have like the pop push. Uh, well, they kind of like mess with the stack a lot because they don't have registers. Uh, so basically, even when you want to do a, like a jump, it has to push like the destination first, like the destination address. And then you would have your jump. But in some cases, in some cases, at the entry point of the function, is going to push like the uh, destination of the um, last basic block of the function, and then it's going to do a bunch of like random operation, and then like it's going to like uh, do a pop to recover it and then jump in it. Uh, so that's why you often need, even like in the case of the actual uh, decompiler, or even like for static analysis. Uh, you kind of need to do like some sort of like dynamic analysis where you need to emulate most of the uh, actual stack operations to uh, keep track of the uh, uh, basic blocks. Uh, the Ethereum virtual machines has a bunch of instructions. So it's kind of like a rich VM, but not too rich. Uh, so you're gonna have like all those regular like operations, like uh, for like arithmetic operations. Uh, you're also gonna have uh, some like sp blockchain specific instructions, like the environment and block information. So like on Windows, you, uh, like you have like the uh, process environment block that contains all the uh, process uh, parameters. Here you would have something similar uh, regarding like your actual block. Uh, if you think of like your blockchain as an actual like current process. Um, and then all your like stack and memory like operations. You have like some logging uh, operations, although like very few like smart contracts use them. And then you have like some uh, pre-compiled uh, instruction like uh, Shafri. So let's have a look at what the actual like uh, assembly look like. So here, 
Say for instance, like here, that's how you would do like um, an actual addition. If you want to add like uh, two plus one, so you have like to push like one and two on the stack, and then you call the add instruction. So that's already like three instructions just for an add. So we're gonna use uh, the uh, following syntax, like the uh, EVM uh, pseudocode, uh, for like the for this talk to make it easier to understand. Then you can also call third-party libraries. That's where it kind of gets interesting in some cases, and in the case of parity, when the guy throws uh, those like three or four hundred million dollars. Uh, it was due uh, to like a call instruction that was not like properly filtered. Uh, so like one of the actual parameters is like the address of a function. Uh, there are only like four addresses that are hard coded uh, for like cryptographic functions or identity functions. Uh, one of the inf uh, one of the uh, thing also to remember is like each address, even though like the registers of the Ethereum virtual machines are on uh, 256 bits, addresses are going to be encoded on uh, 160 bits. So it's quite easy to do like some type discovery to uh, know what's an address or not, because usually you see like an end operation on it, and you just like, uh, well at least like in the actual like uh, uh, tool porosity. I just mark it as an address when I see like it's working on uh, 160 bits. Uh, so when you have user-defined functions, you can actually like pass parameters. Like I was saying, uh, to call an actual function in a smart contract uh, under the hood, what it does is it's passing the actual hash of the uh, function. So and then you would pass like the actual parameters in the um, environment. Uh, information block. So the first four bytes will be the uh, hash signature, and then you would pass your actual parameters. So here, you have a, an instruction called uh, data, uh, well, called data load. So offset four would be the first parameter, and 24 would be like the second parameter, because you are passing like integers uh, to the function. So they're encoded on two uh, 256 bits. And that will be your pseudocode for that actual solidity function. Um, so it's a bit confusing at the, bingi at the uh, beginning, but then you realize it's quite uh, straightforward and very easy. Uh, type discovery, like I was saying with addresses, they are basically like encoded on uh, 160 bits. So nothing complicated here. Uh, you can have some variation uh, done by the uh, actual uh, compiler uh, for optimization. Uh, sometimes you just see like a big end with like that giant mask, and sometimes uh, sometimes it just like computes it dynamically, like uh, what we see here using the uh, exponential function, uh, which works pretty well. So now with bytecode. So once you compile your actual uh, smart contract, like I was saying, you get some bytecode. Uh, and then, you know, like another thing that could have been like optimized, which is not, is you're still going to have the actual preloader of your smart contract inside your bytecode. So whenever it's actually like compiled in the blockchain, you would have like the preloader, which does a, a bunch of like things that uh, could probably like just like be removed, and then the uh, actual like runtime uh, code of the contract. So the preloader is like pretty classic. It's always like the same thing over and over. It would just basically like take the uh, runtime code and copy it in memory, um, then to be later, uh, to be executed uh, later on. The uh, runtime part uh, is basically where we uh, focus on to do uh, our analysis. And that's where you can do uh, like all the uh, function discovery, uh, parameter discovery. Uh, and so regarding the uh, preloader, so the, uh, the most important instruction is called code copy, which is going to copy, which copies the uh, runtime code in memory. And then it's going to copy it at the offset zero. That's where the execution is going to happen. So no, nothing too complicated here. And then we have our actual like, uh, dispatcher. So the actual uh, runtime code is basically a big dispatcher. So for each function you're going to have, you're going to have the equivalent of a big switched. 
and for like each uh, function, you can have a four byte signature, so 32 uh, bits uh, uh, integer, which is going to be like uh, compared, and then for each, uh, well, and once it matches, it's going to like uh, route you to the uh, actual correct function. So whenever you do like the uh, dispatcher uh, analysis, that's where you kind of like see where your function uh, function is or not. And so here, in yellow and in pink, we have like two separate functions. Uh, so one called double and another one called uh, triple, for the uh, example to explain it. And uh, yeah, and as you can see here, so it's gonna push. Also, one of the interesting thing is like um, instead of just having like one push instruction. They have like 32 instructions just for push. They have like push one for push one byte, push two for push two bytes. Here's like push four because it's gonna push like four bytes. Uh, then you have like push 12 and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's quite an interesting design. Uh, to not say weird, but that's the way it is. Um, so here it's quite easy to recognize like all the hash because you just need to look for like all the uh, push for and right after it you would have an uh, EQ, uh, EQ uh, EQ like uh, instruction which is going to compare uh, like the first two like uh, entries of the stack to see if they're equal or not uh, because like in orange it's going to read the uh, information block where it's going to recover the first four bytes of the uh, actual like hash pass to the uh, uh, to the smart contract. So let's take like the uh, first one, the first function. So if it's equal, it's going to like jump to the address uh, 24. Oh. And once it has passed to 24, you have like that. Uh, like that tag, that jump desk instruction saying, okay, that's like the entry point of uh, our current like uh, basic block. What are you doing? You want to talk about blockchain? See, after the crypto kiddies, we have the crypto doggies now. <laughs> By now, this address. Um, so after that, uh, like I was saying, the actual like symbols are being passed uh, through like a JSON interface. That's where you would have all your function names and all your parameters. Um, the way the hash is actually computed, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So just taking the uh, chaffery of the function name and all the parameters type, and uh, for each of them, it's just gonna keep like the first four bytes, and that's it. That's all you have your signatures. Uh, so here, for instance, for double, that's uh, an example here. Uh, that's basically your hash. So every time you're going to call the uh, double in, uh, uh, in, uh, function, that's what you will see. So also one of the interesting things, so let's say in the, in the case of parity, is whenever like something like uh, big happen, like you know like the okay like some wallets are being frozen, uh, we want to look at what happened. Uh, so from an incident response point of view, because everything is logged, you know, uh, each call to uh, uh, the functions are being logged as transactions. So you can actually like, look back to the actual uh, call stack. Uh, or stack call, I forgot who you said. Uh, of all the uh, functions being called. And you can also see like each parameters. So if you look at the actual like, uh, call stack of it, you would see that the uh, first four bytes uh, would correspond to the function, so you would have to refer to uh, the uh, well interface uh, that you have to know which function that I have uh, has had been called. So from an incident response point of view, it's quite interesting because you can actually replay an attack very easily, uh, which is what happened with the uh, parity thing. Like we've been, well, as soon as that guy was just like arriving on GitHub saying, oh, Damn, <laughs> I think I locked everyone, everyone's money. Well, at least everyone could like have a look at the last transactions and see which one looked dodgy. Uh, so that's when hash is being extracted. So I covered it. Uh, I'm just giving you like a compared view of if you use like a purely like static uh, analysis. So you see like there's some basic blocks that are basically like orphans. We don't know where they come from because of those like weird stack uh, manipulation in memory. So you're going to have to emulate the actual like call stack to understand where the uh, call is going to. Uh, so if you would 
if you, we would translate the actual runtime code, that's what it would look like on a raw view. Um, and then you have like the clean view uh, on the right. So as I was saying, it's basically like a big switch, and it takes like each like function signature, and then it uh, reroutes you to the actual function. Uh, and then in some cases, so here, because it's doing some arithmetic operation, it's going to use like the volatile memory. So internally, it, use you, it would use like the uh, M store and um, M load instructions. That's where we see like those memory with the address uh, being used. So that's for the volatile memory. So here, if we would look at the actual execution, so the signature would be passed. Then we would push, uh, so we'd read like the actual like uh, first parameter, and then we'd push like the two. And here, that basic block is shared by the two function for optimization purposes. And then it would call the uh, multiply uh, instruction. And uh, that's pretty much it. Then it would just exit. Same thing for triple. It would read the first parameter, uh, push like three, because we multiply by three, go back to the uh, common basic block, execute it, and then it would leave. So, uh, so few interesting bugs happened last year. So, parity really suffered. They got like uh, at least like two different bugs that were like pretty major. Uh, so one of them, people like stole like 30 million. Uh, so like I was saying, you can call like third-party uh, libraries. So in theory, like smart contracts were designed to be very simple. It was supposed to do uh, very simple uh, instructions. That's why you now you have like new languages called uh, like simplicity, trying to limit the actual uh, capabilities of the uh, developers. Uh, what happened with uh, Ethereum and Solidity is they kind of like try to do like this rich like virtual machine and language, which is like you know like could have been a good idea, but that would have required like more work. But whenever you give developers like too much like power on what they can write, you know they start to like make things that are overcomplicated, uh, especially with like web developers. You know, like uh, uh, if you do like web development now with all the microservices, you know, with all the containers, people like tend to overcomplicate some stuff. So the same thing uh, is actually currently happening with smart contracts. So here you had uh, a wireless library. So here, like that's a simplified view of the actual bug. So the address is uh, outcoded inside the uh, smart contract, and then you have this instruction called delegate call. So then to call like the uh, it's kind of weird, you know, like they outcode like all the functions. It's like a mix between like inline assembly and like JavaScript. So that would be like like the equivalent of the Ethereum inline assembly. It would call the function, and then. So at the, at the back, at the end, at the very end, uh, you have this uh, function with no name, so it's like the uh, default uh, fallback function. So one of the main reasons they have uh, fallback functions with uh, smart contracts is because, like I was saying, if you put code in the blockchain, it's immutable. You cannot patch it, right? So you need to think of a way uh, to be like, you know, like also to have like this issue of being like backward compatible uh, for like interoperability purposes. Well, like here it's like, <laughs> the issue is like, well, you have to be backward compatible and forward compatible. So as well as have like this generic function that can like forward stuff like later on, uh, which is kind of weird. You know, it doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Um, so you have this function. If a uh, function name is not known, it would like call delegate call. And the interesting part here is when the delegate call happens, is it gives you like full control on uh, the uh, data from the environment block. So if you look up. At least it's passing like the hash of the function. You know, you know it's passing an actual hash of a function. It was like here, like the default function. Uh, you know, which in theory uh, w would have super like if you would do it like properly would have su been supposed to be marked as like internal. You know, uh, like as a private function if you're like uh, uh, a C sharp developer. Uh, so here it was not marked as public or private. So there is no such thing. And they give you like full control on it, which means basically you can put the hash of any function you want. Uh, so you can collect any function you want inside the wallet library. So first, it's kind of like too much power for like the user. So that's one of the uh, that was one of the uh, first mistake. Uh, 
So like I was saying, one of the issues is that they have to be like forward and backward compatible, uh, fallback, fun fallback functions, so a lot of the uh, issues are like related to it, uh, even like with the uh, DAO hack that happened, uh, it was due to uh, like uh, one of the, like, those like fallback function. So that's uh, the actual fix. Uh, so uh, the first thing they did is to define some function as private, so with the internal attribute, uh, and then <laughs> And then, so the uh, init wallet uh, function uh, now can only be called if it had been, uh, if it's like currently uninitialized. So what happened is like the attacker, what they did, uh, or the attackers, you know, we know uh, how many like masterminds were behind it, uh, basically like recall the uh, init wallet function a second time so they could just, just like reinitialize it, uh, which was like the, the main problem. So, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like stupid, you know, it's like, you know, when uh, Windows 30, uh, 32K didn't have to have like proper like probing like function at the beginning to uh, filter parameters, uh, while well, it's pretty much like the, uh, the equivalent, there is no like probing of arguments being passed. Uh, but the problem is uh, like, it's not the blue screen of death, you know, at the end, you know, it's like, it's actually like stirring like money. So. Um, that's a pretty good target for attackers, to be honest. And since everybody is like pouring more like money in that garbage, well, more, more stuff is going to happen. So that one was pretty funny. That happened in November. Uh, <laughs> so this is like this guy. He was basically like on GitHub who said, "Oh, accent accent Italy like killed it," you know, with no explanation. Everybody was like, "Oh, what does he mean?" And so that's what I was saying before, is like the thing is if for incident response uh, purposes, it's quite interesting because you still have access to the call stack. So instead of having like a crash dump, you know, from like something that happened, well, you still have the call stack of even like transactions that were valid. So it just gave like the link and you would see that basically did uh, two transactions. So the, the first one, uh, what it did, uh, it was a separate bug, but it took like ownership of the library, and uh, <laughs> and the second, I have no idea why they put all those functions. Like literally, they just like do like the, the weirdest stuff ever. So they had like a function called like uh, kill that would destroy like all the, the contracts. So once he had ownership of it, well, he, he, he was scared someone would take over like that uh, bug. So he decided to kill everything. So that's why like all those like 300 or 400 million like got like frozen. And then people like went into that uh, argument again, like, oh, should we do a fork or not? You know, because that's basically like the only way they could recover money. But because it's decentralized, you know, but nobody is gonna do a fucking fork. You know, like they don't care. They did it like once, you know. But now like people are done. You know, like uh, they keep talking about fork every month. So never gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> the guy was scared to be arrested. That was pretty funny to read, at least if you had no money on it. Also, it's pretty sad. But uh, so what happened? Uh, the actual bug. <laughs> the actual bug. I'm, I'm trying to remember it now. So there is no distinction between uh, an application and a library. Uh, you know, like on uh, uh, like now on Windows, if you write an executable, you, it's different from like a DLL, right? There is like that concept of uh, it's not the same thing. You have like dynamic library, and then you have like application. Uh, well, in the blockchain world, everything is like code. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, they call it library, uh, wallet, whatever, but just like code. So what happened is, he, uh, so he used like the bug to turn one of the actual issue, uh, when, uh, like the main library, it turned it into wallet, so it turned the, uh, you know, like the library into an application. And uh, because like the actual uh, library uh, is a library, it's not supposed to have any owner, unlike when you give like a wallet to someone. Uh, but by design, you know, like the uh, wallet uh, could have been turned into a, a, a wallet directly, which is what he did, so he took ownership of the global library that was used by like all the smart contracts, all the wallets uh, managed by parity. And then he called like the suicide function, which does what the name does, you know, just like uh, killed it all. Uh, so I like, uh, those posts are still probably on GitHub, but I think they're probably like the, uh, the, the, uh, like the funniest stuff online after like all the blog posts from shadow brokers. 
But uh, yeah, so he was like explaining what he tried to do, uh, how confused he was. Um, and then he's like, oh, I believe someone might exploit it. And even you see, like, he closed like, the actual like, GitHub issue, and then he reopens it. He's like, oh, I just killed everything, you know? Um, so, yeah, that was a pretty funny one. So here is like an example of another like smart contract which is vulnerable. So that the type of bugs we can actually detect with the uh, tool porosity. So here is like a simplified version of the uh, DAO uh, smart contract that got hacked. Um, so usually a lot of the functions you would see are pretty similar, regardless if it's like a token or anything. You would have a balance, you would add money, you would withdraw money. It will always come down to like adding or subtracting a value to like um, some uh, array in memory. So here, well, what's interesting and uh, what people didn't think about is so call value is like uh, another way to call like uh, a third-party library. Is you can uh, recall yourself uh, because you can execute like. Um, you, you, you can have like the equivalent of a race condition with smart contracts, which is basically what happened uh, with the actual fallback function. So here, the actual error was not uh, handled properly, so you would think like, okay, like, uh, there is a throw, it happens, that's it. But the problem is like the, uh, the balance was only uh, initialized to uh, zero after at the end. So, you know, instead of like, okay, like let's make sure like the balance is like proper or not. Uh, so that's where like the race condition was. Uh, so they call it like a reentrant vulnerability. Um, so from uh, the porosity point of view, if you do like uh, some disassembly of a smart contract, the way you identify it is quite straightforward. You would look for a call to a third party library, like uh, what we see here, like we see like a call value to it. And then we would track if there is like any modification to the permanent memory done afterwards. So in that case, we would look specifically at the uh, S-Store instruction. And then we would just track each basic blocks and their relationship with each other. So here, uh, so that's an example if you would use like porosity, you would provide the uh, bytecode, and then you would provide the interface then you would run the tool, so that's like the only two uh, parameters it would require. Uh, then it, once you would decompile it, so it would like go through the uh, dispatch uh, function, so the runtime code, um, split all the different functions, and for each function it would analyze each basic blocks and taint each basic block to see if there is like any uh, modification to the, uh, uh, well, permanent memory, the storage memory, then after a call to like a third party uh, library. So here, that's so basically how you would uh, detect it. Uh, then, you know, because it's pretty easy like to disassemble, it's not too complex. Uh, the tool would just highlight it. Um, and that's pretty much it, you know, then you would have your uh, vulnerability uh, being uh, highlighted. So now, so far, there are like few bugs that have been uh, highlighted. So the delegate call was a new type of bug uh, that was uh, discovered with the uh, parity wallet when all the wallet got frozen. So, so far, there is not too many like classes of bugs around smart contracts that have been known. Uh, most of them, when you read about them, you know they're like pretty straightforward to understand. And now there's like more tools uh, to help um, developers of smart contract to actually like well, do a static analysis of the uh, tool, like uh, Mitril or Oyente or uh, Pority. So now it's interesting to see like the actual like security scene around like smart contract being developed. Uh, we integrated uh, with uh, Corum, which is like the uh, uh, Ethereum fork, uh, with like a privacy layer because now with Ethereum everything is public. So uh, Corum came up saying, okay, we need like a privacy layer, so not everything is public in the uh, our blockchain. So we, we integrated with it because the architecture is very similar to Ethereum. Uh, I know what gets uh, interesting is basically well, what to expect in terms of issues like for Tizir. So some of them actually happen over the past few weeks. Uh, it's kind of interesting scene because like every like 
two weeks, like something new is happening. Um, so what happened, um, like I was saying, uh, blockchain applications, dynamic applications, smart contracts are basically like the same thing, but they are like this new layer of application that people are using more and more. Um, just like when mobile applications were emerging, you know, it was kind of like, oh, should we spend time looking at it or not? So it's kind of like in that category. Um, now, what's, there is more like people looking at security uh, around it, and uh, so when I send my slide, no one like actually like publish any uh, like uh, vulnerability inside the Ethereum virtual machine, but just happened like uh, a week ago. Uh, so it didn't provide like a code uh, like a remote code execution for like the actual EVM but uh, why not you know it's uh, bound to happen at some point there is like uh, a C++ implementation and a go implementation of uh, ethereum so like the C++ uh, implementation is definitely going to have like bugs and like i was saying uh, i think it was this one um, so tell us uh, cisco tell us found some bug in the uh, EVM itself so they did not manage to actually like trigger like a code execution out of it, only like uh, just like a DOS, like a crash. Uh, but that's still pretty interesting because it shows that VMs also can have vulnerabilities, uh, which obviously we knew because like we have seen it many times with like VMware Workstation or like uh, ESX or even uh, with Hyper-V. Uh, but people in the blockchain world are kind of living in that bubble where they think everything is secure. So it's kind of... Uh, Interesting to see the world crumbling under their feet. You know? uh, and then there is a bunch of like web security vulnerabilities uh, that also happen. So like uh, with the policy like vulnerabilities, uh, it's also like highly dependent on JSON libraries. Uh, so another vulnerability was uh, found by the uh, same team. Uh, something also interesting, which is. Uh, supposed to be on the roadmap, so I remember talking with the developers, I asked them when it's going to be on the roadmap, they said they're going to do a test running in January, but I haven't seen it uh, yet. So they were planning to use uh, WebAssembly as a virtual machine instead of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine. So some people are looking at an, at an actual replacement for uh, the EVM. Uh, I was a bit like, curious of how it would work, but basically each instructions from the uh, Ethereum virtual machine is just being rewritten in uh, what the name, the uh, WAST, like the Web uh, Assembly Language. Um, so it's an interesting way to replace it, but still like highly dependent on the actual like current architecture, like all the um, like the memory and the registers or the way all those things are done. Um, but then you potentially, you know, it could also like trigger like uh, uh, vulnerabilities inside like the uh, Web Assembly uh, engine. Um, so uh, smart contracts, so there is some new virtual machines emerging, like Chain VM. Uh, IELE is pretty interesting, actually. It's probably like the one uh, I would like focus on like this year if I would have time. Uh, the people who are like designing it used to work on the uh, EVM, and they saw like all those limitations with the stack and everything, even with the languages, the fact that you can write smart contract uh, using a language that you cannot verify in a non-verifiable language is a pretty like strong uh, limitation, especially if you are like aiming at being used by financial institutions. Uh, so like Plutus is also a very interesting language to uh, look at. So like Plutus and Aili are going to be part of the Canado uh, project. So I haven't spent like much time on it, but it seems interesting. Uh, simplicity is just like solidity, but like a much uh, simpler version of it to avoid like bugs due to like over complexity in smart contract. Uh, people like bringing uh, SGX more and more into it. Microsoft also announced, like, uh, even Moxie announced, like, mobile coins. Uh, Microsoft announced, like, Cocoa Framework. Uh, or is it going to be used so far, like, in the context of Ethereum or of any, uh, like, blockchain, like, VM is still, like, to be decided. But we already know that uh, with the create enclave function, uh, you can already create your own enclave, so it's supporting, like, the virtual base enclave and the SGX one. Uh, so, like, interesting, like, DLLs to look at, uh, uh, the ones, like, used for it. It's public. It's on MSDN. 
uh, and then uh, you know, all the uh, things that happened with Spectrum, some people like looked at how to use it against SGX. Uh, I didn't spend much time on it, uh, but it sounded quite interesting. But again, in the context of like a blockchain VM, it does not really matter much if you use SGX or not. Uh, yeah, so two blog posts in that are interesting to uh, look at. Uh, like kind of like my vision for like this year with what's going to happen with smart contracts. Uh, the Talos blog post was cool. And if you have any questions, you can just like uh, send me a message on Twitter or you can just look at the white paper on GitHub. So that.